Welcome back, everybody. This is another episode of Rediscovering God. I'm your host, Steve Eisenhower, and I'm joined with my friend Davon Mays from Clouds of Torah. Uh, today we're going to continue on in our, in our conversations, these classes about the Antichrist and how the reformulation of such a figure is really... I don't want to say exclusive, but the way everyone that's watching this probably understands it is exclusive to the New Testament. So, um, yeah, before we get started, hit that subscribe button, turn on the notifications, and give us both a big thumbs up if you like this like this class. All right. I'll share my screen, and we'll get rocking. Coming through okay? Yep, yep. All right. The New Testament's Disagreements of the Antichrist. A Rediscovering God and Clouds of Torah presentation. All right. We'll start with Jesus' definition of what the Antichrist is. So, Devon, if you want, you can read that. <clears throat> Matthew 4 and 2. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward, he was, he was, afterward and hungered and when the tempter came to him he said if thou be the son of god command that these stones be made bread matthew 4 and 5 then the devil took him up into the holy city and set at him on a pinnacle of the temple and said unto him if thou be the son of god cast thyself down for it is written he shall give his angels charge concerning thee and in their hands they shall bear thee up lest at any time thou dash thy foot against the stone matthew 4 and 9 and said unto him, All these things will I give thee, if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Then the devil leaveth him, and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. Right. So there, we have Matthew 4 showing us that, according to Jesus' definition, the devil is the archetypal figure of the Antichrist as he stands as an apparent opposition to Jesus. Um, and I think most people would agree with that, too. I mean, everyone believes, at least in modern, like, uh, modern Christianity, that any Antichrist figure comes in the power of the devil, right? So for the devil to be the archetype of what that is, I think, makes a lot of makes a lot of um, sense knowing what Christianity believes. Um, but what exactly did Jesus have to say about such a topic? Matthew 13, 37. He answered and said unto them, He, he that soweth the good, the good seed is the son of man, the field is the, wor the world, and the good seed are the children of the kingdom. But the tares are the children of the wicked one. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world, and the reapers are the angels. Right. Yeah, so we see that Jesus, he's stating that, you know, he himself sows the good as the Christ, right, the Son of Man, and the devil sows the bad, the Antichrist. So we now have a confirmation from Jesus that his idea of a figure whose message is the antithesis to his own is the devil. But is that all? Matthew 24 and 24, for there, for there shall arise false Christs and false prophets and shall show great signs and wonders in as much and so much in so much that if we if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. OK, elect obviously being the Christians, right? So we see that the tares or those children of the wicked one. That are going to rise are referred to by Jesus as false Christs. Well, thinking back to all the um, Antichrist topics we've discussed from Tanakh, uh, Christ is just Messiah in Greek, right? So it would make sense. Does Jesus reveal who these people are? So I think by him using the word Christ, I mean, we can't consider it reliable because it's from the New Testament, obviously, but he could have used false teachers. He could have used false 
just false prophets, but he used false Christs or false messiahs or false anointed ones, right? Well, at that time, who would be the false anointed ones? The Christians. Right, but in his <laughs> view, but in his view, <laughs> you're right, you're exactly right. But in his view, it would be the uh, the Jews, the Jews, the priests, right. right? Right, right, right. And what does and what does in John eight forty four here? What does Jesus say to those exact people? Ye are of your father the devil. And the lust of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own. Hmm. For he is a liar and the father of it. Right. So Jesus is making pretty clear that he believes that his fellow Jews, you know, the Sanhedrin, the priests, the Pharisees, to be the false Christs and prophets. Um, we know that. In first century Judea, if you were to walk in here around the temple and you said, where is the Christ? They'd say, which one, right? Because you would have had so many anointed priests. So it would only make sense that he's referring to the religious, the religious elite, you could say, um, when he says false Christs and false prophets. He states they're the children of the devil, the father of lies. Uh, and this is insinuating that by extension, they too are liars. So this here we got this anti-Semitic semitic rhetoric you know just coming through in full force from jesus himself right he's painting with a real big brush because he's a jew right you know his mother's jewish like there's so many jews around him he's he's he's, he's in a world of jews so the other part that doesn't make sense to me he said right. listen to the scribes and pharisees Right. If he felt they were really of the devil, why mm -hmm. would he have you listening to them? Why didn't he say in Matthew 23, listen only to me? Because remember, right. he told his, his disciples, right. don't call nobody a rabbi. You only have one rabbi. Don't call nobody your teacher. Only I am your teacher. Mm -hmm. But then he turns around and says, listen to the scribes and Pharisees. But right. then that's that's uh, where you certainly see where you need the historical context as well to know that Matthew was written in the year 80. But when's John written? you know, turn of the second century, right? Right, right. So when he says, listen to the scribes and the Pharisees, but he, he's thinking they are of the devil, would make sense because he says um, in Matthew, uh, I want to say eight, I could be wrong about that, but it says John's disciples come and say, the scribes and the Pharisees and John's disciples fast, but your disciples don't fast. Right. And yep. of course, he has an excuse. As long as I'm alive, they don't have to fast. But didn't you just say, listen to the scribes and Pharisees? <laughs> right. Yep. So we, we see not only with the Antichrist, the, depending on which book you read in the New Testament, the doctrines don't line up. Oh, for sure. It's totally dependent on who, when, and really what the um, agenda of that book is. I mean, Everyone will say that Matthew is the most Jewish gospel, right? So listen to the scribes and the Pharisees. Um, they will also concede that John is exclusively to the Gentiles, extremely Greek. Uh, and you see that. It's painting the Jews really as the villains. Uh, and it, it's really pulling away from simply just saying, you know, scribes, Pharisees, Sadducees. And really now by John, it's all clumped up together, and he's just saying— the Jews, you're of your father, the devil, the Jews, like as a as if he wasn't one. Right. As if so he wasn't one. Right. right. So you're really getting a, a pulling away the farther you get away from the year 30. Right. Or 70 when we believe the first gospel was written, the farther you get away from that. The more anti-Semitic and the more us against them, the gospels get. Well, another point on that. In the book of Acts, which Luke claims to be the most accurate book, he says, I've gathered all things and I have a perfect understanding. He says Gamaliel, who was one of the chief Pharisees, said to leave the Christians alone. So he yep. wouldn't be so against this movement. He just said, you know, exactly. whatever was, happens, happens. We're, he was the guttle this. of the generation. He was he right. was like the number one. Uh, yeah, no, I'll yeah. say it that way. He was like the number one Pharisee of the time. He was the guttle of their generation. And if he's saying just leave him alone, then, you know, it's really painting such a opposite picture.
Right, right. And this would this would even show why Paul had no reason to go around chasing down Christians if his mm-hmm. so if even though I don't think he was a student of Gamaliel, because even if he was, for argument's sake, he wouldn't have had the teaching to go after Christians. Right. You see what I'm saying? And mm-hmm. on top of that, he would have had to oppose his own rabbi, which Yeah, you know, exactly. He would have been like he would have been a rogue if he was actually doing that. Right. He didn't have the authority to even kill anyone. So the, the whole concept of, of Paul being a student of Gamaliel when he says to leave the Christians alone in itself doesn't even make sense. Right. I mean, let's consider this. The the uh, the Sanhedrin of the time had to deliver Jesus to the Romans just to have him killed. And he was the heretic of heretics, as it's painted in the in the New Testament. Right. That's how that's kind of how they're presenting him. So on whose authority does Paul just be able to go around and beat up and kill Christians? If if the if the leader of the movement, you know, the the progenitor of the movement had to be himself delivered to the uh Romans by the Sanhedrin themselves, right? So on right. whose authority are they just giving this one random guy to go all around Judea and Samaria and kill Christians? Well, when you read in Acts chapter 12, it says Herod stretched out his hand to persecute Christians. Mm-hmm. Now, we know Herod being a Roman. We know Paul being a Roman. You can do a little bit of math there. Yep. But that's another topic. But mm-hmm. kind of see where this where this is going. You know right, what I mean? Right. So it's, it's just not it's not lining up with how the Jews are painted as such 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 enemies when Matthew's gospel completely says, listen to the scribes and the Pharisees. Right. They sit in the seat of Moses. Okay. Prince of this world. So Jesus presents one final idea of what he asserts as there being a coming false Christ. So in John 14, 30, it says, hereafter I will not talk much with you. He's speaking with his disciples. For the prince of this world cometh and had, hath nothing in me. Um, Jesus calls himself the way, the truth, and the life. So therefore, this prince of this world having nothing in Jesus means he has no truth. Therefore, we can understand this as a coming false Christ by Jesus' standard. And I'm just going to back up one slide. And what does John 8, 44 say again, Devon? Ye are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. He speaketh right. a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. Right. And this is really what I'm worried about, because there is no truth in him. He says the exact same thing. In this very, this is also the book of John, but he has the same thing. He hath nothing in me, right? We just said no truth. Um, so it's pretty clear that anytime you see Jesus referring to an antichrist figure, it's one without truth, you know, with the with the power of the devil, you know. The devil is always at the center of everything. You know, and that's, we're really... And as we said, as you're getting farther away from the events, John 95, 100, uh, you're going to be so entrenched in dualism by this point, right? So now it's certainly the evil God or the devil versus the good God, Jesus. You know, so. I mean, even the concept of Satan is not clear because – if Satan already came to tempt him when he got baptized for him to say the prince of this world cometh, didn't he already come if he's already tempting you? Right. <laughs> right. Yep. Right. Exactly. OK. He already so, entered Judas Iscariot like he's already present. Right. Right. And that brings us on to the son of perdition. So perdition in Latin means eternal damnation hell, uh, or utter destruction. So John 17, 12, if you could read that. While I was in with them in the world, while I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. Those that 
thou gavest me, I have kept, and none of them is lost, but the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. Right. And the context of that verse is Jesus, you know, praying in, in regards to his disciples. You know, I kept them, none of them's lost, except the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. So what is the son of per perdition, right? The the son of damnation. Um, so it's pretty clear, since he's referring to his disciples, and only one was was lost or damned, right? This would have to refer to Judas Iscariot. Correct. But if he is, but if he's the Antichrist, um, how could his betrayal be needed to fulfill the scripture? Doesn't make a whole lot of sense, right? Well, this is what's referred to as a false fulfillment citation. And we see this all through the New Testament. Um, I think Matthew has the most false fulfillment citations. Um, mm -hmm. I actually have a book on this. I have a YouTube on it on, on Clouds of Torah. Um, so when you go back and read the, the depending on the book or the Bible you have, it's going to have a footnote. And it's going to tell you what these, where these verses come from. Read the whole chapter in context. Yep. And read the history on that verse because most of the all the actually all the time you're going to read that this chapter is nothing nothing is talking about um, the New Testament's uh, uh, position on it and it's it's stripped of context there's words omitted there's words added and if Judas was really going to fulfill the scripture to tell on Jesus right that's pretty much what he's getting at he told on me right right he accepted well, the accepted the silver. Right. So the problem is, is even those verses about the silver or the New Testament even gives you the wrong prophet that the scripture comes from. Mm -hmm. That those verses are taken out of context. And Judas actually does what the Torah says. It says if somebody's teaching you things that you, you know, uh, that you're not known, that were not known to you, Deuteronomy 13, things that your fathers did not know, you shall expose him. You do not hide him. You do not yep. give him mercy. Right. So for him to even tell on him shows Judas was actually doing the right thing. Yeah. But that's not right. how he's painting. I mean, in the same exact book, the book of John, chapter six, you see Jesus teaching in a synagogue that if you want eternal life, you have to eat my flesh and drink my blood. He doesn't he doesn't make it a last supper. The Eucharist in John isn't like a last supper thing with sim symbology and all that. He outright says in John six and it says he was teaching in a synagogue. That if you want eternal life, you have to eat my flesh and drink my blood. And it outright says that the Jews were like, what are you talking about? This is this is disgusting. You know, this this isn't right. Um, and Jesus pretty much says, well, only those who understand are going to, you know, get what I'm putting down, you know. So we could even see earlier on in John that the people that everyone says were going to learn from Jesus were really kind of appalled at what he was teaching. Right. So it only makes sense that Judas would turn him in like, hey, this guy is kind of presenting some pretty messed up stuff. You know, well, then he's not he's not quoting Torah when he's when he's talking about all this drink my blood things like, for instance, when a lawyer came to him in Luke 10, 25 to 28 and the lawyer said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? If the guy was a lawyer, he, he knew some law. Mm -hmm. So when Jesus is talking to ignorant people and only talking about parables, he could pretty much tell them anything. Right. When somebody who's actually learned, he doesn't pull those games. Right. Um, now, correct me if I'm wrong, Davon, but I think in that exact uh, story you're talking about, his response is, sell everything you have, take up your cross and follow me. Um, so is he outright telling someone, go get crucified and then you can be like me? You can get eternal life? <laughs> well, pretty much now in, in Luke, he doesn't give that answer, but the, 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 a similar answer to the rich man who asked about eternal life. Right, right. Says, right, right. says, you're lacking one thing, sell everything you have and follow me, right? Mm -hmm. Even that's a problem because the Torah never, never says to do that. The Torah says, help your brother, lend to your brother to sell all your things. Right. You will be messing up the inheritance because it says a good man leaves an exactly. inheritance to his children's right. children. So that isn't even a Torah concept. The exactly. Torah doesn't tell you to be a homeless preacher. Right. I mean, so much about so much about the Torah, sacrificial system, etc., is social justice. You know, taking what you have and giving it to help those who have not. Right. So what good is there if you put yourself in poverty 
um, now you now you can no longer give the the uh, lo- acts of loving kindness, right? You can no longer help those around you, and everything you did prior is now in vain. And now so, your family are the ones begging for food. Right. Exactly. So that's 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 not even Torah. He he could have stopped when the guy answered. He says, "Keep the commandments and live." You know, all these extra steps. Oh, one thing else. Follow me. But see, the problem is Luke doesn't say that. He doesn't mm-hmm. tell the lawyer, oh, yeah, you know the Torah. Oh, yeah, plus you got to follow me. He ended it with, you have answered correctly. Yep. Okay. Now we're on to Paul. So Second Second Thessalonians 2, 3, Davon. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first. And that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalted, exalted his, himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he, as God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Second Thessalonians 2 and 8. And then shall the wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming, even him whose coming is after after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. Right. So clearly, uh, Paul did not see the son of perdition as Judas Iscariot, but rather he refers it back to the figure in Ezekiel 28, you know, the prince of Tyre. Um, but we do know that Paul's writings were the first in the New Testament canon. So when he's saying son of perdition, um, it would make more sense that this might be the original context of it, right? So, uh, yeah, he's relating this son of perdition as someone who exalts themselves up above God, right? Um, Right. So it's pretty clear that Paul does not even understand Ezekiel 28. You know, again, we're kind of just showing that there's no way homeboy was a Pharisee. (laughs) Um, <laughs> I have a I have a whole lesson on 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 my YouTube um Clause of Torah on Ezekiel 28 for those who think that's about Satan by the way. Right and uh just a couple weeks back you and I also did Inventing the Devil and have Ezekiel 28 in there also. Exactly. Um so Paul does not understand Ezekiel 28 that it's contextually about the prince of Tyre but rather he rather thinks it's a future evil figure coming under the devil's power. You can go back, watch that Ezekiel 28, uh, Inventing the Devil show we did. Real quick, all it says is that it's it's basically saying that, the, you know, Prince of Tyre, Hiram, he uh, elevated himself up like a god, right? Uh, but Paul seems to think that it means that this person is going to sit in the temple. So all the temple rhetoric we have in Ezekiel 28 is because Tyre, the Phoenicians— they were the ones who were funding the temple, right? Um, yeah, so it's clear that Paul just doesn't understand the language of Ezekiel and equates it to some future prophecy. Real quick, so in Second Thessalonians 2 and 3, the son of perdition, right? Mm-hmm. Can you back up a slide? Yep. So in John's son of perdition, John 17, 12, so we see Jesus' son of perdition and Paul's son of perdition, completely two different types of people. Yep, two different things. Judas is just considered a snitch, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> He's not elevating himself above God. Right. Judas has no – well, he, there is a gospel of Judas that did make it into the canon, but he doesn't have his own book according exactly. to – so far, and he's not, you know, giving his own spiel. Judas doesn't really have much to say in the New Testament, but right. he's the son of perdition to Jesus. He's not the antichrist to Jesus, but right. he is somebody who's fulfilling a, his role, right? Right, and and why would Jesus Satan, call him the son of perdition? We see here eternal damnation is what perdition means. Um, Judas hangs himself, therefore he's damned. According- he's da- Go ahead, I'm sorry. But that's that's what I'm that's all I'm trying to say is Jesus basically calls him the son of damnation. Why? Because he killed himself. You know he right and he, he no elevation of out, God. Right? So he's not sitting in the temple claiming to be anything special. Completely different concept of Paul's son of perdition. Mm-hmm. So right, which is really going to show Paul's Paul's westernized 
thinking here, the, the dualism, the dualism in Paul, the Greek thinking that there has to be an opposition, there has to be a, like a, uh, an evil equivalent to Jesus, right? Right, right. And, and we know, like you said earlier, Paul's writings were first. So whoever is writing John obviously is not aware of Paul's writings. Mm -hmm. Paul's not aware that John's going to be written, so he gave a whole other version of the son of perdition. Right, and if they are aware of Paul's writings, um, they realized in the year 95, well, hey, the temple was destroyed, so whatever this son of perdition was that Paul was talking about can't be right, can't be real. There's no temple for him to sit in. Or and, it already happened. Or, remember, yeah, or it already happened. He's saying for those who saying he's already come that the, we missed it, right? Because people mm -hmm. in Thessalonians think, did we miss the coming? Are we late to the party? And he's like, no, 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 no. Let nobody deceive you for before that comes. So really what Paul's doing is trying to explain why they shouldn't think this way, right? right. But he's not aware of the son of perdition that Jesus talked about is already dead. Mm-hmm. Right. And that's what I'm saying. Yeah. So they're expecting a very imminent second coming. Um, but Paul seems to also be expecting this Antichrist figure to sit in the, you know, sit up in the temple. Uh, Jesus comes back, slays him. Now Jesus is king of the world. Right. So that's, you know, the, the angle I'm basically trying to present is temples destroyed in 70 Paul wrote before 70. Um, so Paul's idea of this son of perdition can't work in 95 when John is written because there's no temple for him to sit in. Cannot so work. he has to recalculate, you know, who could a son of damnation be, right? And it would have to be Judas. So because, you know, he uh, he punched his own punched his own time clock. So. I want to throw some in here too. Um, the preterists. The preterists will tell you right. all this has already happened, right? Mm -hmm. So there's partial preterism, full preterism, there's all type of preterisms. So one of the things that some of the preterists teach, and even other Christians, I'm not even going to put this in the, in the preterist box only, when it says somebody that's going to sit in that temple, this is referring to Titus, to yep. some Christians. Mm -hmm. So Titus was the one who actually was the Antichrist. Some of you yep. would even say Nero. Some even put it on Nero. Mm -hmm. Just depending yep. on who you're reading, what you're studying, your right, time right. frames, all these things. So right. what we're it's trying to do here is flush out all the different versions of the Antichrist and how they all are conflicting. Right. We've exactly. already shown in our previous videos the concept of the Antichrist in the Tanakh is completely different than what a Christian antichrist is. Mm -hmm. Completely different. Exactly. So when it says somebody sitteth in the temple of God, to the to certain schools of Christianity, this was Titus, who was the Roman who destroyed the second temple. So right. and we actually have some we ahead. actually have some Talmudic literature that uh, confirms that. Um, so I know Christians don't normally Except the Talmud, unless unless it uh, helps their cause. But I mean, there is there is a recount of Titus going into the temple, um, rolling out a Torah scroll, and proceeding to have sex on top of it in the middle of the temple. Um, what <laughs> what more accurately presents someone raising themselves up to the level of God and defiling the temple than that? So. I can, yeah, I can get on board with that preterist idea that all of this was written retroactively after things that occurred, for sure. Right. And for those who doubt the oral tradition, I have a video on that. Why do Jews and Christians reject the oral Torah? And I will show you oral tradition in the Tanakh and in the New Testament mm -hmm. and how the New Testament has Jesus practicing the oral Torah. Yep. All quotes the oral Torah. So these things are not something that your church is going to tell you or your pastor is going to tell you because most Christians are opposed to it. But if Jesus is practicing the oral Torah, what does that tell you? Yep. Okay. Now, John's definition. 1 John 2.18, Davon. 
little children, it is the last hour, as ye, <clears throat> as ye have, have heard, that the Antichrist comes. Likewise, there are also beginning to be many Antichrists, mm -hmm. by which we know that it is the last time. 1 John 2, 22, who is a liar, but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ, he is Antichrist, that denieth the Father and the Son. 1 John 4, 3, and every spirit that confess, confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is th that spirit of Antichrist, whereof ye have heard that it should come, and even now already is it in the world. 2 John uh, seven. Yeah, it's just one chapter. So yeah, verse seven. For many deceivers are entered into the world who confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. So you know, hold up a second. Uh, the author of John, or first second John, is bringing something new to the table. Um, he's basically saying that anyone who denies Christ. Is an antichrist. Well, Anybody. In, in the first in the first century, let's think about what uh, the Gospel of John says about the Jews. Who would have been the deniers of Christ in the first century? Every every uh, Pharisaic Jew who didn't follow Jesus. Right, and you know these epistles of John, first, second, third John. Um, are normally dated to 95 to 110, right around the exact same time as the Gospel of John. And why would that be? Because the idea is so similar. Um, you know, opposing Jesus, the Jews are the bad guys. Uh, if you oppose Jesus whatsoever, you don't even believe in Jesus, you're an antichrist. You're a son of the devil. Um, so we're really starting, like I said, we're seeing this, this the farther you get away from the events, the more us versus them it's getting. Real quick, so Paul specifically hones on in the son of perdition. Mm -hmm. Many antichrists, if he would have said sons of perdition. Right? Yeah. yeah, it's pretty clear <laughs> Paul was only thinking of one. Yep. One, right? Jesus only mentioned Judas when he talked about the son of perdition. So now we got First John giving you a a multitude of antichrists. Now he's putting anybody in a box that mm -hmm. don't that don't think Jesus is the Christ. Right. And he said that they're already in the world. Yeah. So for 2000 years, the antichrist has already been here. And he doesn't talk anything about sitting in the temple and claiming himself to be God. It's just simply somebody who says Jesus is not the Messiah. Yep. Now, the question is, why would anybody say Jesus is not the Messiah? <laughs> That's not addressed. He doesn't say why they hold their position. Just like if right. you ask a Christian, why don't Jews believe in Jesus? You're going to hear their version, but ask a Jew, a learned Jew, not just a Jew who goes to synagogue on Yom Kippur. Ask a Jew right. Right. who actually studies why doesn't he believe in Jesus and he can answer many ways, but the reality is, is he sitting on the throne of Israel today, the yep. throne of David today? Exactly. Is there is there peace in the world today? Is there a, is there a temple, temple built in Jerusalem? Jerusalem? I mean, we could go on and on and on. These these are the, when the Messiah comes, it won't be a belief; it will be a reality. You don't have to believe Biden is the president. It's a <laughs> right. fact. Yep. You. You can you can say I don't care. You can say why he, you can have your reasons of why you could care less. But the fact is, he's still the president. Mm -hmm. The reality is today there is no Jesus on Earth. You got prime ministers over there in yep. running Israel. Right, right. You have a temple mount that has a a Muslim mosque on top of it instead of a temple. Mm hmm. So that's why they don't believe in Jesus. It's not because they don't believe in him. It's not that he had to even exist. That's not even the question. Did he fulfill the prophecies? Right. That's what matters. That's what matters. Wait, I mean, they don't they don't disagree that Bar Kokhba existed, but did he fulfill the prophecies? People say that he tried to start building the temple, but did it get finished? No. Is the world peace? No.
was Israel gathered it back into their land? No. So when you so read he, Isaiah 11, Isaiah mm -hmm. 2, Zechariah 8, Zechariah 14, all these messianic prophecies, that's why people didn't accept Jesus as the Christ. Right. Could he have been a teacher? Possibly. Could he have done the miracles? Possibly. That doesn't make anyone a Messiah because in Acts 8, 8, 9 through 11, Simon was doing miracles and had all of Samaria thinking he had the power of God. Yep. Was he the Messiah? No. Nope. But he did the same things Jesus did. Okay. And then one last thing. So let's reread this verse right here. First John 2.22. Who is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ? He is Antichrist, that denieth the Father and the Son. John 8, 44. Ye are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. Seems pretty uh, similar, right? Very similar. And like I said, Jesus makes clear that he believes his fellow Jews are to be the false Christs. And prophets stating that they are children of the devil, the father of lies. This insinuates that they are indeed liars by extension. So they like I said, him as the Christ. These two books were written right around the same time. Right around the turn of the second century. And we have the exact same rhetoric. Um. Coming down hard on the Jews, man. Us against them. It's interesting. Um, verse John two, um, Second John seven. For the for many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus is come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. Well, it says in um, Luke that the kingdom cometh not with observation. Right. So. Who's really being deceptive here? You telling me that Jesus is Christ without me being able to observe it, to be able to prove it, or me not accepting something that you can't prove? Right. Exactly right. In a court system, you got to have evidence. Mm -hmm. You can't believe certain things took place. You have to prove it. You can't say, well, I believe he shot him. You got to prove he was there with the gun mm -hmm. <laughs> and there, there's evidence that he shot him. Yep. You can't just believe these things without some type of evidence. So to 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 put people as antichrist simply because they don't believe something that you're telling them that they cannot observe. Who's really the deceiver here? Right. Exactly right. And finally, the conclusion. So Jesus' opinion. He believes that the devil and those working under his power, i.e. the Jews, are the Antichrist. And what do we have on the dating of the Gospels? Because we used we referenced Matthew and John. So from about 80 to 100 CE. Okay, and then Paul, what does he think? He just thinks of the son of perdition exclusively. Dating back to about 50, 49, 50 CE, right? 30 years earlier. Had and to be the, somebody who sat in that temple. Right. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and then once that temple isn't there anymore, like in the book of John, what do we see about the son of perdition? Just Judas, right? Just the, just a guy who betrayed Jesus, checked his own, checked his own number out. Um, and finally, epistles of John. Anyone who... Def who denies the Father and the Son, that Jesus came in the, or denies that Jesus came in the flesh, anyone who's a liar, right? Anyone. Not the Son of Perdition. Right. So, not even Paul or Jesus' version is the Antichrist according to John. It's exactly. anybody who, you know, denies these things. Mm hmm So, it's, it's just rather um, coincidental that you have that late gospel, you know, John, Gospel of John, around 100 CE, and these epistles of John right around the same time. Right. Which is which would give some uh, clarity, because all the gospels are anonymous. 
it would give some clarity as to why the Gospel of John is named the way it is, because it is so anti-Jewish. It's so anti-Christian, I guess you could say, you know, deceiving and father is your father is the devil, etc. Well, it's interesting that you bring that up because isn't John who wrote Revelation? Another yep. John, right? St. John the Divine. John is of what Patmos, they call him. Right? Mm-hmm. Doesn't he say there are Jews who call themselves Jews, but they're really a synagogue of Satan? We've got the same idea right. that Jews are in league with Satan in all the Johns. Mm-hmm. <laughs> How mm-hmm. ironic is that, right? So to be a synagogue of Satan, in and, and, and John's eyes, is basically saying you deny Jesus as the, the, the Christ. What did Jesus do to prove he is a Christ is the question. That, that's that's something that anybody needs to study, or that's just something that everybody should should want to study. What was the job description of the Messiah? And how can you call me an antichrist if I don't accept your belief in something that you can't prove? Yep. If you can't prove something in a science lab, yet you call me anti whatever it is, right? Mm-hmm. But I can prove to you something in a science lab. You know, there's science is a is something that should be able to be demonstrated mm-hmm. because you got speculative science and you got observable science, right? Yep. You can do an experiment in class. Everybody can see you put water on a plant long enough in the sun is going to grow, right? That's observable science. Mm-hmm. But you know, there's other things that are just speculation, you know? Right. So Christianity is a speculative uh, religion. You're telling me to believe something that you can't prove, that's unfalsifiable. Yep. You know, you, 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 there's no way to say um, Jesus fulfilled the prophecies. He fulfilled all the commandments. Where the, the the text doesn't even say he fulfilled all the commandments. And you can't fill all the commandments because all the commandments aren't for everybody. There's commandments for priests, there's commandments for kings, there's commandments for women. So that isn't even a true statement to say he fulfilled all of the law. Nobody can fulfill all of the law because it's not for everybody. Mm -hmm. Even these types of statements have to be analyzed and put in the context of saying, well, you're you're making statements that are not even accurate. You know, so that's like me sitting in my desk chair right now. Uh. I'm not fulfilling the law to only drive 55 on the interstate, right? But is it even applicable to me right now? Of course not. You know, do we see like how absurd of a claim that is? You know, this is what we're dealing with, y'all. We we have texts that don't agree with each other yet accuse you of not believing them when they don't even agree themselves. If you got Jesus, Paul, and John in the room, whose Antichrist version would you accept? Right. You can't accept Paul's because the temple's already destroyed. Mm-hmm. So there is no coming Antichrist. He can't come. He, he had to have sat in that temple. Who do you know in history sat in the temple and was declared the Antichrist? We haven't even gotten to Revelation. That's right. going to be a whole nother version yeah we're gonna take a whole <laughs> we're gonna take a whole show just for revelation <laughs> so yeah so you know I, I don't even think i need to say anything else you, you guys see the verses nope. you see the That's versions great. of the antichrist and you you tell me which one was it was it judas was it anybody who denied jesus or was it paul's version of what people say was actually titus right so who are, you, who are you gonna side with? You're gonna side with John, you're gonna side with Jesus, or you're gonna side with Paul? Um I think the Christians most, most Paul. Yeah, I, I agree. But I agree. But uh, you know, Christianity these days, uh very much so is saying how much they love the Jews, they want to be like the Jews, you have messianic Jews. Uh Jesus kinda outright said that they're the Antichrists. So uh <laughs> um with that, with that, that would make Zechariah 8.23 mean to the Christian that God wants you to follow the Antichrists. Oh, wow. Yeah. 
or that I or that uh, Isaiah 49 is that you know the antichrists are a light to the nations. Um, right. And with that, I think we can pretty much sign off. <laughs> that's that's Christian theology right there. That's that's, that's how they would have to interpret it. Because so. they're preaching they're preaching that Torah. Don't do that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But all right, everybody, Davon Mays, Clouds of Torah. Check him out on YouTube. Uh, hop over to Amazon, pick up some of his books. Um, got plenty of content on that Clouds of Torah YouTube channel. Uh, and cool thing, a lot of his lectures are pretty long. So, you know, good thing about YouTube, you can play and pause. You know what I mean? So, but there's, you know, hours and hours of content on there. Check him out. Brilliant stuff. Um, but yeah, next time we'll be back with Revelation. Uh, we'll dig into that a little bit and the Antichrist image that it paints. Uh, but yeah, guys, thanks for uh, thanks for watching. This was Rediscovering God, and we'll see you next time, guys.